Can, can everybody hear me? All right, great. So uh, first, thank, thanks for coming, everyone. Um, <clears throat> I spent a lot of time putting this talk together, and I realized 20 minutes is a tiny little overview for a topic like this. I'm doing a three-hour course at SIGGRAPH in two months uh, with uh, Jackie Mori and Kira Maliki Sanchez, and we're going to go into a lot, a lot more depth for that. And uh, let's get started. So I uh, prepared a QR code. Uh, anybody that wants the copy of the slide deck with the hundreds of links that are all linkable, um, take a picture of this and um, see if that gets you to the PDF um, when you have time, after you process your picture. I'll show it again at the end. Uh, some people might want to leave early, and so this is your chance to take the picture of the slide deck unless you want to wait all the way to the end. Let me know when everybody's ready. They all have it. OK. So those of you that will leave early. Hello, everybody. My name is Luis Panos. I'd like to welcome everybody to AWE 2024. I'm looking forward to my son Gregory's session on virtual immortality. I'm sorry I can only be with you in spirit, but thank you everybody for your time and attention. Gregory, take it away. Thank you, Mom. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Come on. So the basic question is, what is virtual immortality? People have been asking me that for two days now. Um, it refers to the idea of preserving one's physical identity, expressions, memories, and experiences in a virtual form, allowing for continued existence beyond physical death. It's kind of a tall order. Uh, it raises questions about the nature of existence, identity, consciousness, and one's uh, human experience while alive, and their intentions beyond their time alive with regard to their self and others. So what might be the benefits of achieving this goal? Well, potential for reunification with loved ones, uh, interaction with future family generations, uh, ancestral history education and connection, and preservation of knowledge and experiences. Uh, those are the main ones for all of us people, regular people, not necessarily celebrities or historical figures. We all desire the same things from uh, a, a well-orchestrated uh, construct and believable persona form of a person that we know and love, including ourselves. So briefly, the history of uh, virtual immortality goes back quite, quite some time, uh, starting with cave paintings and drawings, uh, moving on to sculpture of busts and statues of people, uh, portrait photography, uh, stereoscopic photography, which is actually quite useful uh, in creating 3D models using uh, special photogrammetry techniques that we have available to ourselves today. Audio recording, of course, video recorded interviews, and uh, 3D human scanning, human motion capture, human 3D modeling, human simulation through avatarism, uh, AI personality capture of images, life events and experiential archiving, etc. So each of these milestones have contributed to the evolution of current-day state-of-the-art manifestations of progressively believable human simulation constructs. And uh, these are examples here. Uh, here I am being scanned, is this show my cursor, uh, when I was, I think I was about 32 years old there. And uh, I am the most frequently 3D scanned uh, individual alive on the planet today. I started doing this in my 20s, and every time there was a new technology, I would bug the uh, developers to uh, get in early on the scanner and create a database and have them give it to me as an archive on some kind of media that I could take with me and uh, continually translate the media so it was up to date and I could continue to read it. Uh, this is my partner, Richard, uh, doing one of the live first performance animations at SIGGRAPH using a motion capture helmet that used uh, wire sensors and no, no, nothing optical at the time, but it was enough for him as a Broadway performer to actually sing and perform in the, in, in the uh, uh, Silicon Graphics booth up with a giant screen. He performed Dynamation Man. 
And then there's my mother uh, as a blender model uh, that was uh, being put together by a friend of mine. This is a, a work in progress. We only got started on this a couple of weeks ago. And uh, what kind of tools do you need to uh, do this sort of thing? Well, there are a variety of uh, component assets that can be used to contribute to the ability to create a realistic, effective human simulation construct. Each asset poses specific values in raising the believability bar. That's a term I came up with a long time ago in achieving a desired result. And here are the three primary asset acquisition categories required to engage in a satisfactory effort. Well, physical acquisition is an area that I always felt was super, super important. Uh, back in the day when we didn't have AI to generate images or models for us, um, we had the brute force uh, necessity to 3D scan ourselves with a photogrammetry or uh, other physical camera-based techniques, uh, sometimes uh, using uh, physical uh, interfaces to tra trace points on a sculpture that was made of us. And, uh, and, and, and photorealism, you know, is really one of the goals in creating uh, what I call a persona form. A persona form is, is the, the ultra-realistic construct of a, a living human being. And it was a simple word. Uh, I was hoping it would catch on and it would become something uh, that people would want to engage in creating their own legacy uh, willfully. And if they had a, a, a word that they could call it, then people could use that word and share that word and it become more common. And um, the uh, abil ability for people to um, uh, in engage in this creation process would be well known and, and uh, would be, uh, in our culture, would be accepted. So um, 3D scanning and modeling uh, and then AI uh, can create constructs that uh, can achieve the uh, exceed the believability barrier. And um, animations, sophisticated animation systems that simulate human movement, gestures, facial expressions, uh, 3D models can be rigged uh, to have similar facial expressions uh, from the person that uh, the 3D scan was made. And uh, that's kind of what you're trying to get at. The, with somebody you know and love, you know the way they smile and the way they, they move or wink or make facial expressions, it kind of personalizes it for us. Uh, all of our brain wiring is set to recognize this very subtle nuances and there's a really uh, a real challenging um, process involved in trying to capture that. Uh, natural language processing uh, is another important element that's becoming uh, something that people are paying attention to nowadays with chat GPT and AI and machine learning and large language models is how do you create an AI-powered dialogue system that enables conversational interactions, often indistinguishable from human communication. Um, and part of that is uh, voice modeling as well. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about how I created a voice model of my mother's voice. That was her actual voice, by the way, uh, that I created. And I'll talk a little bit about the pipeline of doing that. Emotional intelligence is, uh, is really a uh, high bar, but something that we all uh, attempt to achieve. Uh, simulated emotional responses and empathy, creating a sense of connection and understanding. Uh, there's a lot of psychology that goes into this. There's been a lot of research studies, and um, there are lots of uh, uh, projects and work uh, for people that have had strokes and other kinds of problems where they're uh, unable to, com uh, to communicate with the full range of emotions that they might once have had. And um, it turns out if you can uh, find reference material of somebody and you can build in a, uh, a brain model of emotional response uh, technology, uh, you can utilize that, not, not just to have a more pleasing interaction with the avatar, but also maybe to help that person rehabilitate and find their way back to the, their, their regular old self they were before there was a problem. Contextual awareness is the ability to simulate and understand and respond um, virtual environments and situations. Um, this is important. Um, when you're interacting with a persona, uh, you want it to understand the home that it grew up in or raised, raised you in or places you visited. and vacations you've taken and all these wonderful experiences you've, you've had with somebody or with, with loved ones. And uh, if you can interact in that environment, some kind of map environment, and this is where XR comes in, you can build these environments and, 
and create simulated uh, spaces and spatially uh, inhabit them with avatars. Uh, re Real-time rendering is really important. We're, we're pretty much there now with NVIDIA chips that are uh, really, really high powered and, and other graphics chips to make the models believable and not cue the creepy factor of our human perceptual system when looking at a, a human form that's uh, you know, animated and trying to engage with them. So uh, seamless immersive experiences are, are supported by high-end real-time rendering. And uh, it used to be impossible to do that. And haptic feedback is another holy grail that hasn't been achieved. But if you're in a virtual environment and you're interacting with a persona of someone, uh, you want to be able to touch them on the shoulder or have them touch your hand if they're having an intimate conversation with you. And haptics can enable that extra sense of, um, of uh, physical, psycho-emotional context. So examples and applications of virtual beings, uh, first of all, the term is evolved uh, that's very generalized and uh, is adopted to refer to relatively anthropomorphic characters or avatars, which is a word I don't like using, but nevertheless. It created uh, to inhabit a live real-time interactive environment, interaction platform as an autonomous agent, we hear a lot about that, chatbots or live performed characters, which is called performance animation, so think of motion capture, uh, creating characters for movies and, and being fully rigged up with uh, sensors or reflective markers, uh, capturing motion and a very high detail and lots of channels of motion. And uh, that can be performed by a real person or uh, those motion capture um, uh, references can be uh, accessed by an autonomous chat avatar as well. So when you are interacting with it, it acts and looks very real because the data came from some real source. And uh, what, what will we use these things for? Well, XR guides uh, designed to introduce us and escort us and guide us, accompany us, uh, entering in VR metaverses and programs and online worlds, uh, multi-user gaming platforms and, and uh, communication environments as well, which uh, we've seen the Apple spatial personas sort of open the door towards using uh, real-time simulations of people uh, that are gathered on the spot by the headset and then formed in, into the uh, internal being of the unit itself and used as a proxy for communication rather than having a camera aimed at your face. Your face is covered, so it does your eye tracking, it does facial expression tracking, but it's actually performing an avatar that it's acquired um, through an enrollment process that happens quite quickly before you engage with the visor. Um, a virtual assistant, uh, sort of like an XR guide, uh, but maybe a little more specific, uh, designed to act, uh, interact with a live person online in, or an XR environment with access to uh, knowledge databases, help files, general internet, or uh, custom curated information assets. Um, virtual influencers are people who are having uh, commentary shows that uh, are just up like uh, char characters that are not necessarily photorealistic of people. They could be animals or some other uh, endearing construct to engage an audience and communicate and create information and most of all uh, the, uh, to, to uh, invent and, and pr propagate a personality. Uh, Mostly non-human, but the human versions are coming. We're starting to see a bunch of companies being launched to do this such thing, to uh, navigate information and uh, help people find things and, and uh, maybe even in psych psychological therapy in, in place of a real therapist. Uh, gaming players. Uh, the gaming industry has been creating virtual avatars to inject you into the game as some kind of likeness of yourself for a long time. Um, in some cases, they're non-playing characters. They have their own personality and their own character Bible that describes everything that they're going to do or say and be how they're going to behave. Uh, and they you know, design act, interact with live, you know, partic live participating gaming characters and uh, understand the context in which they're in. And again, a couple of other companies have launched just in the last couple of years to really push the bar up on that. Uh, Convey, Convey yeah, C-O-N-V-A-I, and, and others. 
And telepresence, you know, to me is my favorite. Uh, if you can uh, broadcast your persona uh, somehow uh, to someone else and they're broadcasting their persona to you, which is kind of what's happening in the Apple system, uh, it, it's a great way to communicate with people and have a more personal experience with them and stay, stay in your pajamas, if you like. So um, there are a bunch of tool offerings that are, uh, I've only picked out a couple that I think are really, really important. And um, Soul Machines is one of my favorites. And uh, they, they create hyper-realistic uh, digital humans. They call them digital souls. It's a very innovative platform. Um, they're emotionally intelligent. They're interactive. They have immersive virtual humans powered by AI machine learning. And they're targeted healthcare, education, customer service, not necessarily for you know, personal resurrection of a loved one or anything like that, but you could use that technology. Synthesia, another company that's uh, really been getting a lot of, uh, uh, of interest lately, uh, has created expressive avatars simulating human-like emotions, expressions, behaviors. These, these, these are recurring themes for uh, the believability bar to uh, be able to approach and exceed the believability bar. If you're a company and you're building products like this, you're, you're all running in the same direction and looking for the same things that you need to, to uh, the, the points along the line, the milestones you need to hit for people to uh, adopt your characters, enjoy interacting with them, and then uh, continually utilizing them and uh, working with them without having a, a high level of rejection. You only, Versona, um, Eternos Life. This is one more or less designed to create uh, constructs and databases of people uh, while they're alive and um, gather personal information about their careers and relationships, videos, photos. Um, and there's a whole bunch of them in Asia that have been started up to immortalize people and, and uh, 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 give honor to their life somehow by applying the technology in a way where all the important things about that person have been considered and have been integrated into some kind of solution. Uh, Storyfile is a great example. And uh, this is a company that started out of the uh, survival of the Shoah project at USC, where they digitized the Holocaust survivors. And then they created a special display system so you could interact with them in a spatial sense as well. And uh, the company nowadays is using branched video, so they um, they interview somebody and they do a lot of video clips and then they align them and then they put them into an interactive database where it will jump around the video responses depending on the questions you use and it can understand uh, uh, spoken audio and then it uses AI and it picks out the responses and plays them for you. Um, Unique, uh, a, a company that gave a presentation here, also uh, virtual agents. Uh, Pin Screen, another Los Angeles based company uh, specializing in lip sync, face reenactment, facial swaps, and de aging, and avatar digitization services. And then Metaphysics, or Metaphysic, a really interesting company creating photorealistic virtual actors and face swap for live performance, video, and film. Um, they won America's Best Talent Award uh, last year, uh, recreating Elvis, and they're building platforms and solutions for movies and television and, and uh, private individuals and quite a few others. Um, this slide deck is going to be available to everybody. Every one of these links is, is clickable, and it will take you to the specifics of each one of them. So I can just click on that stuff. So there's a real gold mine here uh, in, in getting, getting your hands on this slide deck. And it's probably best uh, at 20 minutes that I look through and just glance at them. Uh, some of the in interesting ones are the Metapixel codec avatars that Facebook's working on. They spent a billion dollars on a research lab uh, digitizing people, making very dense machine learning models that are used to approximate um, a smaller uh, uh, data set that somebody can generate with just a couple of pictures of their phone, which create very realistic versions of them. Uh, NVIDIA Omniverse avatar platform is a new product that they're uh, pushing out audio to face, uh, where you feed it audio and a 3D model, and it will perform it with the voice. And uh, VASA-1 has also come on the uh, 
public zeitgeist recently with a lot of fanfare. Uh, Microsoft has created an AI system that you feed it photographs and you feed it video and it just does everything. It makes the animated character, it gives it head motion and facial motion and they're afraid to release it because it just has this huge deep fake potential and of course you know everybody's afraid of deep fakes but everyone I run into when I show them how to make them it, it's like the new rage that's all they want to be doing especially their kids. Um, now, Unreal MetaHuman is a, a large-scale uh, development platform uh, for building virtual characters as well. And then we've got a few other players in there. And uh, I have some uh, 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 related video links. These are all links that uh, you can click on, and uh, it will take you to a web page, and then it will load up uh, you know, whatever the specifics are of that particular link that you click on. Um, uh, uh, writer and inventor, uh, Raymond Curley. The reason I'm calling today is to express my disappointment that you have invited. has been a really uh, a compatriot in this area. I, um, I advised him early on, and he thanked me at a conference in the year 2000 for kind of kicking him in the pants to do this kind of work. He wanted to resurrect his father. His father was very important to him, and he left a lot of life documentation behind, which is really key that we all engage in uh, uh, a, a deliberate process where we uh, take care of our photographs, and we, we name them, and we store them safe, and we make sure that someone has custody over them, because the, the, this is the fodder for the machine that will create a believable human later. This is some of the terms that are being used. and. Uh, these, uh, there's lots of them. Um, grief bot is an interesting one that's been used to describe an AI to help people deal with loss of uh, a loved one or um, an important person in their life. Um, synthespian for a, a virtual actor. Uh, a vector, another term for virtual actor. Cyber persona, virtual being. Um, some of these words are interchangeable. You can add cyber or virtual and add it to another word fragment and create another word. Um, so there's really no coherency in the description of these characters. Um, I, I came up with persona form, which is a subset of everything that's very specific to creating a person, uh, yourself or someone you know that looks and acts like them and you can use it conversationally or to remember a life lived or to celebrate them in some way and interact with them. This is a very seminal um, two-minute uh, thing that I did in 1992, which will uh, tell you how long I've been at this. Another glimpse of the future and how virtual reality will play a part comes from Persona Form of Beverly Hills, California. The company is currently developing technology to archive and simulate real people. The company motto is immortality through technology. The whole idea of a persona form is a varied database. It consists of a three-dimensional personality scan of your human form, your physical shape. Additionally, we're looking at using digitized acquisition of facial models, facial expressions, smiles, frowns, winks, various movements of the lips and cheeks and things like that. We're looking at body-based motion acquisition, the way you sit, the way you bend, the way you jump, various exercises and aerobic routines we're going to record using body-based tracking technology. We're also interested in doing speech acquisition having somebody read from a, a fixed template of word segments and use that to create a dynamic, multiple, real-time, re-indexable speech profile that can get the model to speak, the lips to move in synchrony during a simulation later on. A persona form is something that an individual would elect to create and to update throughout a lifetime. The first time they have it done is called their digital birthday. When you go into a salon, which is essentially a scanning center, a personality acquisition center, and celebrate your first digital birthday, you're essentially frozen in time uh, at whatever age you go in there. And if you have this done every six months or every year until the day you die, your persona form can be accessed through this database or lifeline or data line, have you, forever and ever. And you can be accessed and, and simulated at, at any age, depending on you know how often you've had it updated creating a digital version of you that you hand off or pass on or put in the public domain when you move on to the next world, if there is a next world. That's 
It's a real question, isn't there? So, okay. And uh, this is another really quick example of a 3D model once you have one. A friend of mine uh, created this. He scanned me at AWE a number of years back. And uh, it came out pretty good. It was a special purpose sensor attached to an iPad, and he walked around me and uh, captured my uh, ugly, unslept, unkempt mug for the day. <laughs> You can do a lot with this data. You can dress it down later if you like. So that's important to know. And uh, okay, so lastly, <clears throat> so I've been recreating my mother. This is a work in progress. And um, I digitized my mother in a 3D scanner um, 20 years ago when she was 80 years old. I dragged her up to a studio in Hollywood. She was just, she loved meeting all the people in Hollywood. And uh, they sat her down. We used a structured light scanner. I think it was an InSpec at the time. They're not even in business anymore. But uh, it was just a nice little afternoon. And uh, I kept the data. I made sure that it was important enough. Uh, I, I think of this kind of stuff as sacred data. And, uh, so I gave it to a friend of mine who's a VFX artist, and he used it to fit the facial model in Blender. And he's a very gifted artist. His name's Mike Amron. And I also sent him a lot of reference pictures of her, because as an artist, um, he could model her just with refer refer reference pictures. Uh, but not everybody has that kind of skill. Um, so this is the real, the real deal, the ground truth, brute force way to do it. Is 3D scan somebody, and then you get an artist to just make it beautiful and perfect uh, with the human touch. And uh, of course, AI is going to replace replace all those intermediate steps that require all those skills. But nevertheless, you'll end up with a believable character that is somebody you love or care about, and that's really, at the end of the day, the most important thing. Um, I also, I captured spoken audio. I went and I farmed through my videos, and I isolated my mother's voice. I took away everything except her voice. I cleaned it up in an AI program, and then I fed it to another program called Replay AI. This is something you can download and run on a high-end machine pretty easily. And I trained a model of her voice. It only took maybe 20 minutes. <clears throat> and what you heard was, was, was her actual voice from that source video that I had extricated. So it's really all about assets, um, where you get them, how you save them, how you tag them, uh, how you translate them into newer formats so you can utilize them later. Then we imported uh, the uh, Blender model into NVIDIA Audio to Face, but it didn't import the hair, so she looks like she's on chemo, but if she, I have another animation of her talking, but it's in, not in this presentation. And then we created a voice model. And the way I did that is I just spoke her voice in a manner that she used to speak in the way that I remember her. And then I bumped up the frequency of the voice, and I applied her voice model, and it sounds just like her. So. Wow, Gregory, that was a great presentation. I can't wait to see what comes next. Bye, everybody, and thanks again for coming. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. And there's the, uh, the slide for you to scan if you want again. Uh, the, the, all those links in the video took me a really long time to accumulate, and I have probably three times as many. Um, a lot of them specific to uh, news articles about people who have uh, tried to immortalize a loved one or that they're, they're ill and they're, they've been given a life uh, you know, a time that they're going to be living because they have serious cancer and uh, they want to leave something behind for their loved ones. Or, In my case, um, my uh, father died when I was 24, my brother died when, he was, when I was 27, and then I had a lot of illness in my life and I was worried and I decided that I really needed to focus on this and I'm still engaged in it and I created the Persona Foundation to um, uh, invite people to participate and share and uh, try to make these um, techniques and workflows uh, evolve so all of us can do it and do it easily and uh, engage our loved ones and, and uh, start
to participate in the ritual of creating and saving assets and treating all our photographs of our loved ones as sacred data that has a higher purpose. Thank you.